technology is your friend. It's interesting. I see a lot of these articles on, on LinkedIn now that are popping up and it's like the consultants are all like technology is not replacing salespeople. Cold calling isn't dead, et cetera, et cetera. And I see a lot of the tech companies writing articles that are like sales AI and sales machine learning and blah, blah, blah is the next generation. And you have to read all these things and listen to all these people in the context that they're saying them. Like everybody that is writing these articles is selling something. something. So they have a bias, like they're completely biased. And for us, we hype a lot of technology and, you know, we leverage technology in our sales process at Udemy big time. And that's why we're so efficient, but it's not replacing people. It's supporting people. And there's things that you can do that might've taken you 20 minutes that now take you 20 seconds or less. Hey y'all, welcome to Selling with Social, the podcast that helps marketers increase marketing qualified leads, sales reps to shatter sales results, and sales leaders to grow as leaders. Each show, we interview sales, marketing, and social media practitioners, leaders, and influencers to help you connect, close more deals, build stronger relationships with clients, and improve your sales productivity. I'm Mario Martinez Jr. You're now listening to Selling with Social. Today's guest is Max Altschuler. He is the CEO of Sales Hacker, a rapidly growing media company focused on the future of B2B sales. Max is also an author. He wrote the book, Hacking Sales, the playbook for building a high velocity sales machine which was recently published by Wiley. Aside from Sales Hacker, Max is an angel investor as well and advises startups around the globe. I am so excited to have him on today's show. Without any further ado, let's welcome Max. Max Altschuler, you are the freaking man. I'm so excited that you're here with me on Selling with Social. Thanks for joining us. Let's think about this. Author, CEO, investor, advisor, a guy who loves dogs, single guy. What don't you do, man? I'm everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know no, you just good. got back from like yeah. Japan or you were traveling all over the world. I mean, we were trying to yeah. schedule this and, and your schedule is just crazy. You've been like 77 different countries. I think mm-hmm. that, is that the number now? 79. Yeah. Just got back from Japan and the Philippines. I've had uh, a few employees in the Philippines outside of Manila f- since 2011. And I just actually, uh, got a chance to meet them in person on my most recent trip. So it was the first time I ever met them in person and uh, their kids call me Uncle Max and you know it, it's pretty cool to kind of have that bond and uh, they've been great. They're you know, great employees. So it's cool. I love it. Well, you, you've uh, definitely built a, a phenomenal brand for yourself. Congratulations on that. Well respected in the industry among sales peers and among sales leaders. There's a lot of things you do. So I can sit here and talk all day long about you, but why don't you tell our audience a little bit about yourself and your background, how you grew up in, into uh, this world of uh, stardom and fame here. Yeah. Well, thanks for that introduction. Um, thanks for having me on. Yeah. So came out to San Francisco, let's see, five years ago after college, went to a company called Udemy, built the supply side of their marketplace. Um, so we had to get instructors online to teach courses back when you really started having cameras in your computer and your cell phone that were good enough to do anything on. Yeah. And so it was like really good timing for the marketplace. And if I were to tell a, you know, someone who was an amazing salesperson, an amazing yoga instructor, hey, you can charge people to take a class online, take your class online. You could finally record that content yourself. And it's something that probably couldn't be done before. You had to get a huge, you know, crazy camera set up and, you know, have a quarter and, you know, director or whatever and a backdrop. But, you know, now this was possible. So we helped instructors get online on Udemy, built that out. You know, I think they just raised 120 something million in Series D funding, but doing really well. Went to a company called Attorney Fee after that. Ended up, uh, I was VP of business development there. Ended up selling them to LegalZoom and then started Sales Hacker. And, and really over the course of all that time, we were doing some really cool things with technology, virtual assistants in the Philippines, you know, some psychological stuff as well. And not a lot of people in the startup world knew how to do any of this stuff. So um, we were doing meetups, we were writing content about it. One thing led to another. We did a, you know, our first conference in September of 2013. And now we're doing you know, 2,000 person conferences. We ran the SASTER annual for the last two years, which is the big B2B SAS conference. So 
kind of everywhere. I wrote the book, Hacking Sales. I actually wrote that from Bali in less than a week, in like 30,000 words. That was a, a highlight and uh, got them published, got that published by Wiley afterwards. And yeah, I mean, we're just, uh, we've always been honestly and authentically about helping people get better at sales, build modern sales processes and leverage technology in the sales process. Well, you make me feel kind of bad because as you know, I think, uh, or you may know, I was in uh, Hawaii for the month of December with my family and I was trying to write one of our eBooks all about leveraging Twitter and it's still not done. Yeah. <laughs> so for you to get the hacking sales done in uh, one week in Bali, man, you just get, I don't know, I've got writer's block, something. Yeah, it's on. a little easier when you're single and you have all the distractions around, you know? That's, so. that's true because every two seconds I got the, the three-year-old trying to jump off into the pool and he's about to drown and the yeah. three-year-old saying, dad, dad, dad. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I was, I was pretty zenned out. It was just yoga, writing, writing from the pool, writing from the beach, but it's, it's nice. You know, you need to to get out. And then um, the best thing about doing it from Bali is the, uh, the time differences. So you yeah. do it during the holidays. I did it over you know, Christmas and, and New Year's. And one, most people aren't online. But two, uh, during my daytime, it was, everybody was sleeping in the US. So yeah. I don't have emails coming in. I don't have to you know, sit there and feel reactive. You, know, you get up first two hours of the day, you can get all the, you know, the reactive work off your plate. And then the rest of the day is just really buckling in and, and writing. And uh, the book is just a brain dump of stuff that I've been doing for the last, you know, five years. So it really just kind of came right out. It was pretty fun. Well, hopefully I'll have my Twitter piece done uh, by the end of January. You <laughs> You'll be my accountability partner. Make sure you there check you back up with me on that. <laughs> Hell yeah. Let's do it. Well, listen, you, you definitely, without a doubt, I mean, your, your track record is impeccable. The things that you've been able to accomplish have been amazing. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, congrats to that. You, you definitely give a, a lot of hope to entrepreneurs, to startups, to millennials especially. And quite frankly, folks like myself who are at the 40-year-old range and above, you've got a, a very interesting mindset that's critical to success. So talk a little bit about that. I want our listeners to understand like this mindset that you've had from the beginning, that like you started seeing a vision, you started down a path, you started being focused. What is the mindset that's critical to success? Growth mindset. I heard the, the quote, the 20s are for learning, the 30s are for earning. And, you know, it's like something to live by. And honestly, I think that like even uh, 40s, new 30s. So, you know, you, sh you should still just be obviously always learning. Yeah. But for if you focus on trying to make money in the short term and make as much money as possible, you're probably going to limit your long term upside. And for me, it was never about how to make a lot of money right now, how to make a lot of money right now. It's about cutting my teeth. I made very little money at Udemy, but now my stock is worth a lot more, you know, I, but Absolutely. that's what you do. You have to have that like long-term growth mindset. And what really I loved about Udemy was that I was going to get in there and see how the sausage was made. They had raised a small seed round of funding. You know, we had this mess of opportunity, you know, worst case scenario, I get an amazing education, helping grow a business in Silicon Valley. And I, you know, I, I make some connections and I learn a ton and best case scenario, it's worth something, you know, my stock's worth something later on. I know a lot of people who went out you know, worked at a, a startup or a tech company and, and picked the wrong one. We got a great education, but, you know, their stock wasn't worth anything. But you know what? They use that education at the next one. And you just, if you keep picking, it's really just about learning and creating opportunities for yourself. And if you're learning and you're doing a really good job and you're working hard, people will take notice. And so if you're not successful on that try, you'll have other opportunities for better tries because you're showing people how awesome you are. You're showing people how good you are, how dedicated you are. So it's like one of those kind of game trees where it's like, I'm going to go all out. Did I pick the right one? If yes, you'll make a lot of money in the long term. If no, you'll open up opportunities to get another opportunity to hit on a good one. But if you're not working hard and you're not showing up and you're, you're not growing, you're not learning, you're not paying attention to that, then you're just not going down the, that path. You know, if you, if you go into corporate and you make a, a salaried wage, um, you can probably make a lot more money than I was in the short term, but your your long term is capped. Yeah, absolutely. So the mindset that's critical to success is learn. I heard you say learn, mm -hmm. then you grow, and then you build upon what you grow. Yeah, and you just you like stay focused, stay dedicated, and share what you know, and opportunities will open for you. Sounds good. And you think about. Uh, all the stuff that's out there, our digital footprints are crazy. Everybody almost knows everything about us. But give us something, one thing that nobody would know by looking at your social profiles or your digital footprint about you. 
It's actually funny. I wrote a, a whole article on this uh, on Medium, just like, you know, who am I type thing. Let's see. One thing that nobody would know. I have OCD. So I was just in Japan and like, I really felt at home because every, everything there is like super organized and OCD. So <laughs> um, I have like, I'd say minor OCD, but I think it helps me in business and definitely in my personal life. It's a little bit of a pain in the ass. <laughs> um, but I've had OCD for, you know, as long as I can remember, I keep the remote straight, you know, channels on the same thing, but that's an interesting one. And, uh, big into hockey. So I grew up playing hockey and I still get a chance to play. Moved back to New York recently and uh, get a chance to play a lot more now than I did being in San Francisco or before that. Awesome. Well, I'll tell you a, a very easy secret to getting rid of the OCD. You want to know what that is? What? have kids. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I got a dog and I already see that. It's like there's toys everywhere. And my OCD mind had to, I had to get out of that. Started spazzing out already. Yeah. I remember when, uh, when we first got married, my wife and I, her name is Shauna. And I used to travel a lot. I would literally come back home. I'd open the door up and I wouldn't even say hello. I would open the door and I would say, was someone here? Who's here? <laughs> She'd be like, what is your problem? Why would you ask? Like, I'm like, well, the pillows moved, the chair's out of the plate. <laughs> so she, you know, and she was just like, you got issues. And then yeah. as soon as the kids came, you just you throw it out the window. It's all gone. Yeah. I'm like, you cannot keep control anymore. So that's, that's how you solve the OCD problem. <laughs> I like it though. You know, for work, it keeps me super organized. I'm on top of everything. So it's good for work. For personal life, yeah, could, could do without the some of the crazier stuff. But. I love it. I love it. Good. Yeah. Well, through Sales Hacker, which is your company, you're the CEO of Sales Hacker, you spend a lot of time helping sales leaders and companies build modern day sales processes, ramp up revenue. You've definitely had an impressive track record with helping organizations do that, especially startups. So give us a little bit of your secret sauce, three secrets on how to ramp revenue efficiently and effectively. Yeah. So efficiently, we'll actually... What's good, we'll break it into those two things, basically. So efficiently, technology is your friend. It's interesting. I see a lot of these articles on, on LinkedIn now that are popping up, and it's like the consultants are all like, technology is not replacing salespeople. Cold calling isn't dead, et cetera, et cetera. And I see a lot of the tech companies writing articles that are like, sales AI and sales machine learning and blah, blah, blah is the next generation. And you have to read all these things and listen to all these people in the context that they're saying them. Like everybody that is writing these articles is selling something. So they have a bias, like they're completely biased. And for us, we hype a lot of technology and, you know, we leverage technology in our sales process at Udemy big time. And that's why we're so efficient, but it's not replacing people. It's supporting people. And there's things that you can do that might've taken you 20 minutes that now take you 20 seconds or less. And if you can save that 20 minutes a day, that's 20 minutes of research you could be doing or other things. And, or like even the research stuff can be automated now. So you know, I'm not saying that you know, we're definitely not hyping that any of this stuff is going to replace salespeople. And it might at some point, but you know, not right now. You should definitely just don't ignore technology. I mean, there's some amazing things out there that are being built that can save you a lot of time and make your teams a lot more efficient. As far as the effectiveness goes, that's where the training comes in. Like a lot of these companies are like heavily venture backed right now. And so they're like, oh, we'll just we'll throw a lot of money at onboard, like hiring people. We'll throw a lot of money at technology. But then they don't spend any money on training. They don't spend money on getting these people ramped up and like understanding the product, understanding the sales process, understanding how to use the technology. And so then it's like a huge waste of money. So between those two things, yeah, invest in technology, leverage technology. Technology is your friend. It's not trying to replace you. And then, you know, make sure you're training your people. And then, you know, the other thing I think is when you're like hiring and uh, onboarding these people, and maybe the third thing we can say here is just have a process. And like go by that process and stick to that process and like don't make exceptions to that process. That's one of the things we did really big at Udemy and one of the things we, we still do now. We have a process. Like we, we go by that process. We tweak it over time, make it better, but there's still a playbook or a process or something. Because if you can't test it and measure it, then it's really tough to make it better. Those are great pieces of insight. Uh, So since since you mentioned it, there are a lot of folks that are out there saying salespeople are going away and uh, that that sales staffs will be cut in half. What's your opinion on that? You think uh, salespeople will ever go away? No, I don't think they'll go away, but you know, there's definitely things that'll happen in the future. And I think like 10 to 20 years from now, that'll make the salesperson's job maybe less necessary or, or maybe people hire less. I mean, if you look at the, the B to C market and you look at Best Buy, when you used to buy a TV, 
you'd go to PC Richards or Sears or Best Buy or wherever you go. And then you'd ask the guy, hey, you know, what TV should I buy? Uh, you know, I, I like something that's 50 inches. I'm usually into like Samsung or something like that. And he'll show you the TVs and try and sell you one. And then you put it in a van and, you know, uh, you or they go. send it to your house. Away you go. And now, you know, I bought a TV the other day and I don't go into a store. I go to Amazon.com. I type in TV. I, I click the button for 50 to 55 inch. I click the button for Samsung. Maybe let, let me look at a Sony or whatever else. And then I see one that says 4,600 and whatever reviews, four and a half stars. I click on that. The reviews are good. Bye. It's at my house in two days. So I didn't have to go through all the other stuff because I had, I had my peers, basically, other people that were like me telling me what was good. Now, at some point, the technology that people are selling right now and the products that people are selling, like there'll be a review system for that. And you'll be able to sort people that are similar to you know, your type of buying process or whatever. So if you go to G2 Crowd or Trust Radius or you know, I don't know, maybe other sites will come out. But I'm sure at some point you'd be like, listen, I, I have, you know, I have this many sales reps. This is who we sell to. We would need an outbound emailing tool. Let's see which ones have the best reviews. And then they can go and say, okay, well, now our decision is between this one and this one because they have way more reviews uh, and better reviews than the other ones yeah. for the people that are in our situation. So it's really just waiting for these technologies and like these review sites to hit critical mass for those reviews to actually mean anything. Because if it's 50 reviews, it doesn't mean shit. But if it's 5,000 reviews and each one of them has 5,000 reviews, yeah. then you start to really actually take those into account. So at some point, maybe things phase out a little bit. But for now, nobody's like people buy from people. Like nobody's completely removing the rep and technology is there to kind of support the reps. Some of the best technologies I see are purely about supporting reps. Yeah, I, I definitely uh, think on the B2B side as well, you're going to see a lot heavier investment on the inside sales track and then a lot heavier investment in the reps that actually have the ability to help close and deliver on relationship and actually nurture those relationships to be able to help continue growing those accounts. And I think we're seeing a lot of those types of activities taking place where, you know, these, the quote unquote field sales rep that you once had, that was the cold caller as well as the closer, as well as the everything in between and the nurturer, you're seeing a, a defining split between those roles, be able to have people focus in on some of those areas. So we'll see what happens. I mean, the reality is, is I, I agree with you hundred percent. Reps aren't going away, but how we leverage our reps, I think will start changing over the course of time. Yeah, of course. And it should, the way people buy evolves, the way people sell needs to evolve as well. I, I got a question uh, that I want to talk to you about that in a little bit, you know, in terms of how the buyer has changed and it's been some dramatic shifts as well in just in, in the way they engage. And you gave a great example of that in terms of what you did with the TV. But I want to talk a little bit about one of the things I noticed specifically with you is you've definitely taken a special interest in the millennial workforce, the millennial sales workforce. You've taken this very interesting focus, which I, I appreciate, and you've got some great insights in some of the things that you talk about and write about. Tell us a little bit why you have this special focus. Yeah, and thinking about focusing there even more, I, I'd say in like a, from a business point of view, the workforce is becoming increasingly more millennial. That's just right nature. Those people are aging into work. But really, like I'm a millennial and I don't feel like the world prepared me very well for the situations that, that I'm in. I think like the only decent thing about college is that it teaches you how to be social and like yeah. build social skills. Possibly. And it might, yeah, possibly. And it might actually teach you how to learn or help teach you how to learn. But the things you learn there are, you know, in a lot of cases, I, I felt very pointless. And I felt like I had gone to college and I didn't get the most out of it because I almost it maybe wasn't even ready for it. Yeah. And maybe there are other people in my situation that were, but like I picked a major when I was 18. What did I know about what I wanted to do? So why do I spend four years and all that money focused on that major when like, you know, maybe you should go to the workplace first. Like maybe you should start figuring out what you want to do before you specialize like that. I don't know. But the point is we're learning how many cells are in a leaf and we're learning, you know, <laughs> which is like metamorphic and igneous rocks. Like I'm, I was hiking with my nephew the other day and we're like, I'm quizzing him on that stuff. Like I remembered that. Nobody ever like in school taught us how to balance a checkbook or, you know, do right. an Excel spreadsheet, like the basics, like things yeah. like that. So people come out and they're expected to know these things, but nobody ever taught them those things. And, you know, I'm fortunate enough to have a, a father who was, who was there for me in a lot of different ways, but still like even the basic stuff like tying a tie or, you know, dressing professionally or business you know, etiquette, 
what's a, what's APR on a credit card? Yeah. You know, like how is that not something that's taught in college? Like that's something that people need to Google. And if you don't get it tough, you know, you maybe go into the bank and hopefully you get somebody nice enough to sit down and explain it to you. Right. Right. um, You know, somebody has got to have their backs because everybody else is too busy really shitting on them on the internet. If you looked up some of these titles of these articles, if you replaced the millennial word with like a culture or a gender or a race, those would not be on the internet. Wouldn't be allowed. Like, <laughs> they're like the Guardian, the Atlantic, those types of things. Like, are you kidding me with that? Like, I'm a millennial. I don't get easily offended. And I'd rather just like carry a chip and prove it than like have a, a offensive reaction or something like that. Cause yeah. that does absolutely nothing. Like I'm not posting on Facebook like this is offending me, but it's kind of crazy how, and it's been okay. Just, destroying uh you know a whole generation oh we're lazy this that and the other thing so you know somebody's got to have their back i don't think in a lot of cases there was a a completely fair shake and you know the funny thing is the the people who raised the millennials are the ones complaining about the millennials (laughs) you know like yeah we we didn't make ourselves you know but but you know then there are a lot of people who uh groups of people give you a bad name so I appreciate that. I, I think there's a lot of stuff that's out there. And I think there's, uh, it's funny, even our, in our own business for M3 Junior Growth Strategies, actually my focus has been trying to bring on the millennials. Because one thing I do know is that millennials can be very focused if you put them in the right direction and yeah. they can deliver for you. And you tell them something one time, usually, and they go. Whereas, you know, your other folks, you've got, well, what about this? What about that? And all, you know, yeah. so so I, I love the fact that you have had a special focus on them. And I cannot disagree with you about your college uh, illustration there. So I went to UC Berkeley, was at Cal for five years, and I thought I was going to do something really, really ingenious. Now, why I thought I was going to be able to get away with this, I don't know. I can't tell you that. But I went out and I took courses specifically to be able to solve lower division and upper division breath requirements. So by the time that I had, I think it was almost 80 units, and you need about 120 to graduate, I literally had all my upper division courses uh, fulfilled, all the breath requirements, and all my lower division courses fulfilled. And I couldn't graduate from UC Berkeley, because I had to go back and take, I don't know, econ 101, stats 101, stuff that like, was like, really? So anyways, I I was so fed up with the system. I ended up leaving UC Berkeley. I ended up going back because I had a great leader, uh, Chris Bryden, who said, you know, I'm going to put it in your review that you're going to do this on an annual basis and finish your degree off because you need it. And I'm glad I did. So I went back to St. Mary's and I got my bachelor's in business management. So it was the right thing to do. But I totally get you in terms of not preparing us, the generations for the actual workforce. Yeah. And you know what? I don't, I don't take sides either. Like I'm not saying, you know, millennials do this and other generations do that or whatever. Like it's not about pointing fingers or taking sides. It's just about having their back because really not a lot of people in a, like in a public figure position do, or not a lot of people in a high enough position to get any attention usually like would be in that position to, to kind of have their back. And you know what? Like, People are raised differently generation to generation. Obviously, that goes without saying. And so people are going to work differently. And like you need to adjust if you're going to make the most out of these employees. You need to be in a position to get the best, the very best out of the people that are working from you, no matter who they are, what generation they come from, where they come from. And that's on you to do. That's not on them. And so if you don't figure out how to get the most out of them, then don't hire them. That's fine. But guess what? How much of the workforce is millennial at this point? Probably like 60%. That number is only going up until the next generation comes in. So you better figure it out or retire soon because realistically, you're going to be in a pretty shitty position. You know, and that's one thing. And then like, you know, obviously for business purposes, these are the people that, you know, are in our audience that are coming into the workforce. You know, we, we try and be the next generation of sales. Next generation of sales is technology and the next generation of sales is millennials and we're not just here for millennials but we're we're here to really help everybody kind of figure out how are we going to get the most out of these like business relationships how are we all going to succeed together and i think a lot of people are are having trouble with cracking that that nut like how you know all right this is a different generation they do things differently i think simon sinek had a really great video he did that yeah recently, you know talking about how to get them to do, you know, their best. Yeah. How do they like to learn? How do they like to interact? It's a different generation. This is, these are the employees that you're going to get. There's some really good talent there. 
you got to figure that out. You know, it's a different skill now. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. No, I agree with you on that. Let's move on into uh, uh, talking a little bit about the sales stack. This is definitely right up your alley. You, something that you're very passionate about. Uh, everyone talks about tools. We talk about automation. We talk about the need for more tools. I think in the book, Hacking Sales, you identified over 150 different tools to help sales organizations at the top of the funnel, mid and at the bottom of the funnel. So lay it out for us. What should an organization be focused on to grow revenue with the thousands of tools that are out there? Yeah, now there's a lot more. I mean, that book, the first version of the book was written uh, end of 2015. And you know, it's really easy to get seed stage money right yeah. now. So a lot more investment being pumped into sales and marketing tools. But I think you really obviously need to take a pulse on your organization, your sales process and figure out, you know, what you need as an organization. Like, do you need an instance of Salesforce? Are you doing less but bigger deals? And maybe, you know, a base or a, you know, a pipe drive or something like that is, is better for you. You know, who are you selling to? Are you selling to you know, tech companies or are you selling to mostly like manufacturing or healthcare? There are obviously different databases out there that cater towards one or the other. Are you selling to mid-market or enterprise? Again, different databases that cater towards one or the other. You know, I think everybody's using LinkedIn. You, you know, LinkedIn has, you know, all the data and it's being updated, you know, probably more timely than, you know, any other data source can possibly be because the person's updating it themselves. Yeah. Now, obviously there's, you know, other social channels and stuff like that, but, you know, there's outbound emailing tools, there's, you know, dialers. There's a lot of technologies out there that are kind of like features and will eventually become platforms. But it's really up to your organization to take a look at, at what's out there, survey the field, and, you know, put together something that, you know, maybe you have a budget, an overall budget, and that says like, okay, we're going to spend $500 a rep uh, per month or something like that. And figure out what fits into that, into that uh, structure before you go out and, you know, you start spending. And then also, you know, figure out your training strategy before you start spending money on these things. You know, buy products that that are easy to implement, easy to onboard, and you know don't require special consultants and things like that. You know that can really hang you up on implementation time. And depending on the size of your organization and how long you've been around, obviously, you know speed wins, time kills deals, time kills businesses. If you're an early stage company and you know you can't get something implemented right away, maybe that's not the right product for you. Yeah, great. Those are, those are all um, great points. Would you say for sales organizations, be more focused on some of the tools at the top of the funnel? mid of the funnel or that support the bottom of the funnel type of activities? Or does it really depend on what to, to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. I mean, I guess there's a lot of variables there. You know, there's really no one size fits all or silver bullet, so to speak. I think you see a lot of the VC money and stuff going into top of the funnel right now. Cause everybody's like, Oh, if we, we have more leads, we'll have more business. And, you know, yeah. the easiest way to have a good month is really just to have the, a fat pipeline or a good quarter is to have a fat pipeline. But you don't want to have a leaky bucket problem because then right. you're just burning those leads. So you need to make sure that bucket is secure and shored up. And then uh, on the, the back end, I think like, you know, one of the most underrated parts of the sales process right now on the customer success side of things uh, is, you know, the, the ag advocacy type stuff, the referral stuff, and the, you know, upselling and cross-selling that you can do. And there's a lot of technology out there that's being built for that as well. So that's actually a pretty exciting area because I don't think it's gotten a lot of love. And it's one of the hardest roles to hire for in, you know, as a, you know, somebody who's really good at customer success and can kind of lead the way on those things. So I think ahead of demand gen and ahead of customer success are probably two of the hardest roles you can find, you know, right now at any size company. And there's a lot of technology that's coming out to support those areas. So I'm excited about the future of, you know, both those, both those roles. Yeah. Awesome. No, some great insights there. We talked about this a little bit earlier in the podcast, actually your experience about how you go about buying a TV today mm -hmm. and the way that uh, the buyer's behavior has changed for salespeople. So thinking about this change in buyer behavior over the recent years, that the ability to have access to information and research information is at a click of a button that you could go out and hear reviews, see reviews. You can go out and get information, you can go out and do product re research. You can go out and understand what's happening in the marketplace. How has that affected selling in today's modern world? Yeah, it's, it's given you a ton of power. But I think the, you know, the buyer has a lot of the same information that the seller has. And the seller has information that they can use to either prepare themselves in a way where they are pre-qualifying the person that they're talking to or playing a better psychological you know, connection level game 
with the person that they're connecting to. Whether you're using that information to, you know, in the past you would use BANT on a discovery call and you'd have a call and you do a qualification call and it's like, what's your budget? You know, is the timing right? Et cetera, et cetera. Are you talking to the right person? And, you know, you could do a lot of that before you ever get on a phone call now. You know, the, the yeah, LinkedIn, absolutely. the internet, you know, crunch base, things like that, have all that data. You know, the person just raised $50 million in funding. They just hired a VP of sales operations. Like, yeah, okay, timing's looking good if you're selling something into sales ops at that company right now. Looks like yeah. they have budget. Looks like they, you know, looks like that was an important role that they just hired for. Like, you know, there are other things and clues that you can get that like pre-qualify companies without having to waste time on that call. And, you know, every second on that call is a precious second. Every question you ask is a precious question. So now you know the answers to those things really or, you know, have a better hunch than actually having to waste that time on that call. And then secondly, it's like, you know, people like to get challenged or people like to get flattered or whatever, you know, kind of game you want to play or, you know, way you want to build a rapport. But if you have some information that you've been able to get on, on the internet about these people, you can do, you know, more interesting things. You know, you're, you're, are you a Broncos fan? Before I pull up my demo, should I change my background and my computer to, you know, Broncos, you know, John Elway holding up a Super Bowl trophy or something like that? Great like, idea. Yeah, you know, exactly. Maybe that'll trigger something, you know, like build the rapport a little bit more. Oh, let me just pull up the demo screen real quick. And then you're like, okay, what are, what are the things you can do to kind of play those psychological games or to, to use that information to build the rapport? You know, so you're just playing off those different things. I think the two main things are pre-qualification that you can do online with that information and then using that information to build a rapport quicker. I would totally agree with you. One of the number one problems that I've seen in our sales processes and sales methodologies today is new sales reps and old sales reps are not preparing for those meetings, for those discussions. And as a result of the virtual world that we live in right now, where I would argue that majority of our meetings are not face-to-face, -face. majority of them are through a conference call or through a virtual meeting, uh, some sort of video collaboration software that you may be using. I would argue that you've got to work harder to find those. You may not remember, but in the old days when we were being taught to sell, when we walked into someone's office, the first thing that we're looking for is the big fish on the wall. We're looking for the picture of the family, right? So that we, we could understand how to start our conversation about, hey, where'd you take that picture? At? Oh, how big was that fish? Or, you know, oh, how many kids do you have? So you can start that conversation off with the first 10 minutes, 15 minutes, really getting to know that person to build a rapport. But now, as a result of the virtual environment, you may be meet, meeting with somebody in a conference room that, that they don't, aren't sitting in full time. Mm -hmm. so that prep work, I think, is critical for sales folks to really do better at selling and to build that relationship with their uh, potential buyers. I think that's one of those things that's like you hear from a lot of consultants today and you hear from a lot of technology providers today. It's like, um, yeah, a lot of the strategies that have been in place for a long time still work. And like, we're not an organization that's saying that's not true. We're just saying like, okay, well, like what's the modern version of that? Like how has yeah. that modernized over the years? And I think that's a good example of one of those things where it's like, you used to do those types of things to, to build the rapport when you walked into the office and now you're not walking into the office anymore. You're walking right. into a zoom.us conference room or a, you know, go to, you know, WebEx or whatever it is. And so, you know, what are those other things you can do beforehand, you know, direct mail, is one of those things that like has made a comeback recently with a lot of VPs that I've spoken to. And you know, it's not, you're not sending a flyer. You're sending something like super relevant that you would have never known before this information was available to you on the, you know, on the internet. We were at a good point too. So, so yeah, I, I agree with you. You know, I think that's some great uh, piece of advice in relation to, you know, the preparation and really focusing in on that particular element. And then also too, you know, focusing in, I think the art of selling has been lost in many ways, because we're not focusing on really building that relationship over the course of the sales cycle. And a lot of folks have asked me on the social side, like, you know, when's the right time to be able to connect to somebody on, on Facebook, right? Because like, you know, Facebook is that personal social channel. And I almost tell everybody like, like, you know, you like, think about your friend, you meet somebody, you know, maybe you're out and about at, at a social gathering, you kind of know when to connect with that individual. And it's important that you move into those phases of connecting with your buyers over the course of that sales cycle. Because when you do that, 
you begin to see more personal related items. They'll, they'll showcase more information to you. And that's how you start building back into that rapport and that personalization, whereas opposed to this churn and burn cycle that I see a lot of sales organizations doing, you know, pound the phone, pound the phone, appointment, 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 appointment. And it's like, well, what time did you spend building rapport for those opportunities that you know are truly opportunities? Yeah. And I, I think that's w one of the things that we just, we need to get back to good old basics in terms of building rapport. And I think sales leaders also need to give their salespeople more runway to build those relationships because that's, I mean, let's just face it, man. It's like I was on the, on the horn with Anthony Anarino and Anthony said, all things being equal, relationships win. All things being unequal, relationships win. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important that, that sales leaders understand the, those components in terms of uh, working with whether it's a, a millennial, whether it's a field-based uh, uh, guy or gal, is build the relationship and focus in on building that relationship. So let's, let's go into thinking about advice, advice for sales leaders. One piece of advice that you'd give sales leaders in today's modern selling world, if you would. We kind of went into a lot, of, a lot of the advice already in terms of you know, elaborating on if you're investing in technology, which you should be, you know, make sure you're supporting the reps, uh, make sure you're investing in training, make sure you have a process. I think those are like the main pieces of advice and I don't have like any one thing again, like it's not a silver bullet type situation. So we've, we've gone in, into depth about millennials, technology, everything else. So I think you're missing something, bro. What? I tell you what it is. The one piece of advice that, that you'd want to give sales leaders, I'm gonna give it for you. How about that? Join revenue summit. <laughs> there you go. I like it. Hey. You're selling for me. That's, there you go. Revenue now, summit. Man. Yeah, that's, that's, that's great. San Francisco. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that because that's actually uh, what I was thinking of. If you look at all the things that are out there and available for sales organizations, you, you've managed to put together very successfully massive sales conferences from formerly known as Sales Hacker, now Revenue Summit. I think you joined in with Flip My Funnel. Is that right? We usually do Sales Stack as our San Francisco uh, sales technology conference. And okay. we partnered up with Flip My Funnel folks over at a SaaS company called Terminus that are doing similar stuff in the marketing space. So it's a sales and marketing conference. It's about 2000 people all focused on scaling sales and marketing uh, within their organizations. You know, everybody from uh, hyper growth venture backed companies to fortune 500 companies come to our events. We've got a couple of big partners, Salesforce, uh, HubSpot, Marketo, Mintigo, a couple other uh, big ones. So should be really good. We've got some amazing speakers we're about to announce from some really good companies who have been there for a really long time and have, have kind of seen how the game is, has changed a little bit and really relevant content. It's like coming from practitioners who are in your roles at companies that have kind of been there for a while, pre-IPO through IPO, or we've got people who have been at companies that have IPO'd recently that were there when they were zero a uh, million in <laughs> exactly, you know, like in ARR now, you know, added a, a one zero to the front of that. So yeah, um, it's pretty cool to not only hear their stories, but really learn from them and, and get actionable content from them that can, can really help you at your current uh, organization. So individuals that should attend uh, sales leaders for sure, mm -hmm. enablement or sales operations uh, managers or, or, or leaders. Yeah. What about the rep? Ops, sales development. Yeah, reps should definitely come. Uh, if, you, you know, if you plan on progressing throughout your career, uh, I think a lot of content will be focused on getting your reps to do X, Y, and Z. Or we're probably focusing on people who influence the reps the most. And then a lot of content is about like, you know, maybe playbooks around things that your reps can do. So I think reps will find a lot of value. Uh, the content is definitely more targeted on you know, kind of director, manager, VP level. We have sales ops, enablement, sales development, inside sales type roles. Well, I think if it, uh, our listeners and those that are in sales are listening, we talked about something that was very important in the beginning. That's the mindset to success, right? And you mentioned something about making sure that you learn and that you grow. And so if I was a rep, which I was in my 19 year uh, career, I paid out of my own pocket hundreds of events that I would attend just so that I can learn because I knew one day that I would hopefully be in a sales leadership position or leading a sales organization. So yeah. honestly, I cannot disagree with you. If you're a sales rep, I think you should be attending as well. Besides the content and the content's great. You know, the learning experience that you're going to get from listening to these guys is awesome. But you know, the speakers that speak at our events, you know, uh, if you get the, you know, 
the VP of sales at a company like, you know, HubSpot that took them from zero to, uh, you know, a hundred million in, in revenue or something like that. They come, but they stick around. And then, you know, the rest of the audience is people who are you're currently doing this. These are your peers currently doing this at, you know, hyper growth companies or, you know, public companies, good people to know. So it's really about, you know, building your, your network and, and learning as much as you possibly can. And, you know, we say learn, um, discover and network and, and discovers new technologies. So we've got some, uh, some of the best vendors in, in the sales and marketing ops games that'll be there. And uh, yeah, hope everybody can, uh, can make it out to San Francisco, March 7th and 8th. March 7th and 8th. And how do you register for it, Max? TheRevenueSummit.com. We'll make sure we put that into the show notes for anybody cool. uh, who's uh, watching that. Cool. And uh, if someone wants to connect with you, reach out, ask any questions, get advice. What's the best way to get in contact with you? LinkedIn is always uh, the best for me. Awesome. Yeah, so Doc Houchler. request to connect with you, email yeah. you or message you, something like that? Yeah, email me or message me on LinkedIn, connect with me through there. Or uh, we have a LinkedIn sales hacker community group. So just type in sales hacker community and uh, pretty active in there as well. Yeah, gotcha. And then uh, your book, Hacking Sales. Let's, look, we can't, I can't leave the show without yeah. talking about the book, man. We've obviously talked to some of the things that we talked about today are definitely within the book. If someone mm-hmm. wants to get a copy of Hacking Sales, which I do recommend, especially as you're scaling an organization, or even those that are there and trying to grow an organization, they've got their organization, where can they get a copy of Hacking Sales at? Yeah, hackingsales.com. Get on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, where, wherever you choose, 800 CEO read. So listen there. And if you like it, leave a, leave a good review. I hope you enjoy it. If you don't, don't leave the review. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. If you don't, you can email me on link or message me on LinkedIn and give me a bunch of crap for it. I love it. I'll, I'm going to ask you just two quick closing questions here. All time favorite movie. Oh man. That's like saying what's your best favorite restaurant in New York city. <laughs> That's like impossible. impossible. Uh, All time favorite movie. I don't know. I'll tell you mine. It might inspire you. Did you ever watch The Goonies? Yeah. It's a great one. My all-time favorite movie. And you know, want to know why? Why? Because you had, oh, geez, the, what was the guy's name that, that was the leader of The Goonies? Um, the, what the, he had the asthma, the, the uh, pump spray all the time. It just, oh, yeah. It just escaped me. Anyways, the leader of the group was able to inspire 14 people to do something crazy and go on some adventure. And everybody, when I watched that movie as a kid, we all wanted to be a Goonie. He's like the inspiration behind that. And turns out, I actually went to uh, UC Berkeley with Chunk, if you remember Chunk from the mm-hmm. Goonies. He and I are now connected on LinkedIn and we converse every once in a while. So uh, it's kind of funny. I'll tell you like one that I saw recently, that's, a, that's an oldie but a goodie, uh, Last Samurai. Oh, okay. That was, was that with Tom Cruise? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was, I was just over in Japan. I was like, I got to watch The Last Samurai. So I really like uh, I, any movie with some kind of like just deep, deep roots in like culture, but also has a good story to it. There's like one that's uh, kind of corny that, but like mixes my two favorite things, the hundred foot journey. It's like food and um, just like kind of European and Indian culture. So like that kind of stuff. And then action and comedies pretty much. Oh, don't breathe was another good one. I saw recently like horror movies. So I don't know. I don't have a favorite. <laughs> All right. I love it. Last question. What inspires you? You know what? I, Every morning I, I wake up and I stare at the ceiling and I do, it probably takes like five minutes, but I think about everything that I'm grateful for and then everything that I want to happen. And, you know, the recurring themes on, you know, what you're grateful for is just if everything failed right now, I've learned so much that I know I'd be able to go and, and support myself. And like, I'm forever grateful for that. And then my family and my friends and like everybody, like as long as everybody's happy and healthy, they're all happy and healthy. And like, it's nice that I can focus on what I'm able to focus on and that everybody's like taken care of. And so pretty grateful for that, that I don't have like a sick parent or child or something like that in my life, that something that has like that weighs on you big time. And, yeah. and then I'm grateful for the fact that, you know, like we said earlier, if it's one of those like teach a man to fish type things, yeah. it's, you know, if you give somebody a fish, they eat the fish and like now they're hungry again. But if you teach them how to fish, then they could always supply themselves and support themselves. And so yeah. that learning experience that I've been able to have and the connections that I made, and it's, it's nice knowing that I don't have a mattress full of cash, but I do have a particular set of skills that can hopefully generate whatever I need. 
I love it. That's great. Uh, family, good health, and take some time to, to show some yeah. appreciation for uh, yeah. what you've got. And, wake up with uh, a smile every day. Smile. If you do That's that right. every day, you wake up with a smile. No matter love what's it. going on, you find the things that are, that are important. Well, Max, I cannot thank you enough for joining this podcast here with Selling with Social. You are awesome to, to interview, man. And we've had a great time spending some time with you. And for those of you that are listening, we'll put all the websites that we referenced in the show notes along with the Revenue Summit. Highly encourage you guys to attend that particular event. It's going to be a great event here, especially here in San Francisco. So Max, you're the man. I appreciate it, buddy. Thanks for having me. All right, bud. Take care. All right. See you. Thanks for listening to the Selling with Social podcast. I'm super pumped that you are our guest today. Here's what I want you to do right now. Go to M, the number three, jr.com forward slash podcast and support our podcast, please, by distributing it out anywhere you can get it to on social. And don't forget to subscribe to us on iTunes. You'll find all the instructions there on the site on how to subscribe to the Selling with Social podcast. Until the next show, keep on rocking. Mario Martinez Jr., out.